I'm Alistair Cook, for those who are not familiar with my moustache. Uh, joining me today from Ravello is Gal Marv. Hey, thank you for joining us, and can you tell the lovely folks at home a little bit about yourself and your role here at, at Ravello? Yeah. So uh, I'm Gal. I'm uh, leading the inbound product management for, uh, for Oracle Ravello, uh, part of the uh, Ravello team since the early days, uh, six years ago. Um, and uh, happy to uh, have you guys here in the Oracle Ravel offices. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the Oracle Ravello is an Israeli origin company. Um, we are not actually at nine o'clock in the morning on Thursday. Uh, Thursday. It's actually seven o'clock at night here because we're in Tel Aviv. And um, we've, Jeffrey and I have been spending a, an awesome few days here in Tel Aviv. And speaking of Jeffrey, uh, as always behind the, the cameras, behind the switching, is Mr. Jeffrey Powers, our uh, international man of mastery. Uh, say hello to the nice people, Jeffrey. Hello to the nice people. Jeffrey Powers here, of course, my Twitter handle being Geekazine. Uh, you can find, uh, welcome to the uh, build day, welcome uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, it's 7 o'clock at night or really early for you in the morning, 9 a.m. Pacific time, so we're going to have a great uh, great few hours here uh, building systems uh, as always, so remember the hashtags, uh, uh, build day live, and of course uh, Ravello Systems is their Twitter handle, uh, and uh, go over to builddaylive.com. Hi, Jeffrey. Um... Now, we should preface a little bit about uh, what Ravello, our Oracle Ravello product is, that it's part of the Oracle Cloud initiative, and then the new Oracle Cloud initiative, they're very different to, to the older, um, older generation of Oracle's cloud. And um, can you give us the 30-second, the, the this is what Ravello is introduction, Gal? Yeah. So Ravello is a, is a service, a cloud service, as you mentioned, part of the Oracle cloud infrastructure services, which include many cloud services in it. And in a nutshell, what Ravello is designed to do is to let you take your on-prem workloads, which is usually VMware-based, but it could be also KVM, and just create a, an exact copy of the workload in a public cloud. And exact copy means the same virtual machines, really the same disks, the same configuration, just copy paste on an exact replica of the network. So same layer two, layer three uh, topology, uh, same features available, VLANs or what have you there. Um, you can take your virtual appliances as, as well into the cloud uh, such that so you have your production environment in VMware. You can just like, copy-paste it, run it in the cloud, and do all kind of great things with it. Which with all of the sort of mobility and, and flexibility and pay-per-use elements of a public cloud. Yeah. Yeah. But without the redevelop of the whole application from the ground up in order to get it onto yeah. public cloud. Yeah. yeah, so simplicity was uh, our one of our main design goals from day one. We knew that it has to be the process has to be really simple, otherwise there is uh, no. One of those barriers yeah. will stop people yeah. from adopting. But one of the things that I've seen, I've been working with Ravello for not quite the six years, but I think probably three years. I've been involved yeah. with Ravello one way or another, and one of the things I've seen is a big change this year is much more of a focus on enterprise production apps yeah. than more of your sort of contingent workloads like the test and development or spinning up a training environment, which, which prior to the Oracle acquisition was the, the bread and butter of, of what you would do with, with Ravello. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we're going to do in this build day is to take a, an on-premises uh, enterprise application, in this case Siebel Call Center, and migrate that up into the Oracle Ravello cloud and show that the same application runs, that it's a straight upload. There's no machine conversion. There's no changes to the virtual hardware. All of that goes straight up. Um, so unlike many of the build days, there's no hardware to deploy. Uh, we haven't had a nightmare with the network, which those who have watched previous build days know that we've we've had a nightmare with the network on every one of our build days uh, previously. Uh, and so really all we needed to, to do this was a small on-premises vSphere environment. I'll have a quick look at the on-premises vSphere environment to run the enterprise application and then some internet to, to get it uploaded to Ravello. And that all went 
shockingly smoothly. And so Jeffrey and I got to spend some time on the beach here in Ravella, uh, in um, Tel Aviv. <laughs> but Ravello it, Beach is beautiful as well. For Unfortunately, we've, we haven't had another city added on, on this build day. We've just been here in Tel Aviv for this one. So let's take a quick look in, in the lab at what we're starting from so you understand that we are starting with just a, a vSphere environment. And I really should have logged into the vSphere client before I started um, started the live stream because, of course, vSphere client takes a moment to three to log on. The lab that I brought with me is much less extensive than usual. It's just a single ESXi server, little Intel Nook. And it's not running a huge amount at the moment, but we do have this one V app that is running the Siebel application. And you can see that it has a bunch of virtual machines in it. And this is a database server and gateway and app server and all the things that make up an enterprise application. So it's a, a nice collection of virtual machines running to make up this the Siebel app. And the way we access it is just out of a, a portal web page here. We've got a, a link to access our Siebel call center. And I can log in and uh, see the Siebel call center application, at least I would if I could uh, remember my password correctly or type my password correctly. So I put two A's in S admin. Um, so this time I'll log in successfully. Once again, the way that you can tell that this is a, uh, a real live build is that things go wrong. Uh, and of course, I'm not a SQL Call Center user, so I've just found the, the little pieces in here. So um, Cornell from Tech Marketing at Oracle Ravello has, has helped us set this up and, and shown me a little bit of, of SQL Call Center, but we can see uh, contact information in here and, and see that we've got access to a, a real enterprise application. Uh, so that's our starting point. We have this on-premises application, and we want to migrate that up into the Ravello public cloud. Um, I, one of the things I really like about the Ravello solution is that it is all internet-based. All you need is a, a web browser and an internet connection, and you have access to the system. Lots of really good information here on this front portal page, this um, cloud.oracle.com. US uh, English Ravello page. Uh, from memory, I, this is also the page that you land on if you go to ravellosystems.com. Brings you to this landing page with lots of information about Ravello uh, product and uh, lets us see what's going, you know, see the insides of the product, do a, a bit of uh, learning. And there's a, a um, free trial. Um, Ravello, as an independent company, always had a really good free trial program. And uh, there is a, a very similar program now that they're part of Oracle. Of course, I'm going to log in and go into the, the portal here, log in with my credentials and get access to my existing environment. And the thing that I first need to do is get the Siebel virtual machines into the portal, uh, into the, the Ravello platform. And at the moment, I've got a bunch of virtual machines. Uh, I've uploaded most of the virtual machines, but I've got another virtual machine to upload, which is the, the file, the Siebel application. All of the virtual machines need to be uploaded out of your existing environment into, into here, although there are some templates that are built in if you want to build applications from scratch. But generally, if you bring in that enterprise application, you can use the import virtual machine wizard. And the first time you run this, you actually have to install a tool that does the, the import, a uh, nice little Windows or um, command line tool or, or also a tool for Linux or Mac, so nice collection of platforms supported. Uh, real easy install. Just a nice little Windows installer. Yeah. It's basically a Python script and small one, and that's the only on-prem piece of the system. So there's no agents to deploy, there's no, no other pieces of software. And log in again. Uh, where did I put my password? There it is. Yeah, and since I spent a lot of my professional life carrying big boxes in airplanes, I was extremely happy to uh, build this product that has no hardware. And I didn't do my cleanup. Naturally, we have done a dry run and we have tested things and then done most of the cleanup. But one piece I didn't do was <laughs> remove the record that I previously uploaded the file system virtual machine. So now I'm going to upload a new item now that the um, upload is installed. As you can see, there's a variety of places you can upload from. 
uh, depends exactly where you're starting from, uh, which one you'll choose. And particularly, I like that I can upload my own ISOs and I could actually start with an empty virtual machine and install my own operating system if that was the deployment methodology. But we're migrating an enterprise app, so I'm going to connect to my existing vSphere environment. And that is my VC and uh, administrator lad.local, uh, my password, typo in there. Good thing I saw it before I hit enter. And so here's my vCenter server, my ESX server. This is my Siebel um, V app containing all of the VMs that we saw in the vSphere client. And this last one that I want to upload is my Pharsis virtual machine. And then away it goes and says we're going to start the upload. Now, it's uh, 1.4 gigabytes of virtual machine to upload. It's going to take some time. Um, this is a fairly standard migration of virtual machines into the cloud as upload of some, some process. Um, the OVF files would take a while to upload or potentially download from, from some internet site. It was really nice to spend some time chatting with um, Benny. He's two doors down in the offices and has, has dropped in a couple of times to say hi. must be quite inspiring working with a serial entrepreneur like, like Benny and uh, produces a very great culture in this organization from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah, Benny and, and Rami uh, Tamir's partner, uh, this is their fourth startup together as, as founders and they're part of other uh, ventures as investors and, and board members. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was great. We learned a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a great experience for, uh, I mean, I've been part of startups all, all my uh, career. That's, mm. uh, that's what I do. And uh, it was great working with them. Uh, first time working with, uh, with, with such experience. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Rami is, is in um, Seattle meeting with other Oracle Cloud um, execs, and so we didn't get the opportunity to meet him this week, but uh, there'll be another day for that. Yeah. So our progress bar has been progressing. It's reporting that we're 2% complete, and so, well, that's not the most positive sign, but it's not actually a negative sign because these progress bars, and like all progress bars, lie. Yeah, yeah. Progress bars, yeah, they're, they're designed to uh, uh, let you feel that there is progress, not <laughs> necessarily report on the exact percentage. Uh, because in many cases, it's, I mean, there's no really way to tell whether, you know, if it shows 50%, does it mean that it's going to take the, the same time mm. to complete? No, because it depends on the network. And the network is, I mean, we're we're now in Israel. Uh, the uh, the VM is now being uploaded into your uh, library, which is actually in Virginia, right, in, in the U.S. Uh, quite a long way, all the way down the Mediterranean through uh, Greece, I think, and and the U.K. Um, and it, it sounds uh, like it's cruise liner going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I was, yeah, I hope that no one steps on the line and yeah. blocking the packets from getting through. Uh, but, but it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a big file, so it really depends on, on a lot of factors. But So the thing I've noticed is that it's, although it's reporting 3% complete out of 30 gig, there's in fact only 1.4 gigs to upload, and, and now it's just under 1, one gig of that has uploaded. So uh, the progress bar is showing us progress yeah. but, it's, uh, but yeah. I, I happen to know for this VM that it's not, not nearly as, yeah. as long a progress yeah. to wait as, as you yeah. might think. And, and on top of that, we're trying to optimize the upload, right? So even if your file is, let's say, one gig, it still might be that you need to actually upload far less than that in terms of bytes because we do a, a dedupe and uh, we reduce the, uh, the zeros, the empty parts of the file. So it really depends on, on the way uh, the uh, disk is it's set all up populated, on the, on the VM. so it's yeah. really down to the actual data inside the VM yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that is constraining here. Well, the other thing that, that goes on, I was talking earlier with, with Omri about the network discovery piece, and so we have a, a video that talks about how the auto-configuration of the networking occurs. So during that, the upload process, all of that network discovery goes on. That's, that's a pretty cool feature. 
Yeah, that's uh, it's one of my favorites. It's uh, I mentioned before that one of our design goals was around simplicity, mm. and I spent many years as a product manager in enterprise IT companies, and I know that one of the uh, the, the the barriers, the big bigger barriers for product, is the fact that when you come to deploy your product, you usually need to get the help of multiple different functions in the organization, right? So your user or your customer might be looking at a product I've built 10 years ago, might be the security guy, but you need to get the network architect to uh, uh, give you a spend port and you need to get mm -hmm. the uh, uh, data center guys to give you a slot in the in the rack right, 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 yeah, and yeah. you need to get the application guys to def to explain how the application is set up and then the database guys to give you the database details just to install your security sniffer the kind of look at the traffic four or five different teams just yeah. to get this one thing yeah and and they usually don't i mean yeah everyone cares about security but it's not their main job right it's the security well, yeah, manager being the security job. guy is a hard road because yeah. you're the, the guy who what's the no yeah, and yeah. I, i've been flying back and forth from tel aviv to san francisco twice during one week with a big server uh just because i got to a customer and the networking guy said oh, it's, we're not really what it is. take it away now, send me the diagrams and send me all the documents and we'll talk about it so we wanted so first we were very happy that i, I was very happy that this product doesn't include any hardware, any hardware but i really wanted to build a product that doesn't need the help of the other functions in, in the organization and when you want to create a replica of your environment your production environment in the cloud yeah. it's you know it's, it's very complicated right so you need to understand the virtualization aspect so which are the vms and what are their hardware what is the hardware configuration of each vm then you need to understand what is the network configuration what are the ips what is the uh, uh, topology uh, dhcp details uh, and so on and then you need to get the application deta details so you need to know you have a web server that needs to talk to a database. So what are the IPs and what are the, the host names? Mm -hmm. Each one of these pieces is a different function. And we wanted to build something that would be bulletproof. So you get the one function in the organization. In many cases, it's not even the virtualization admin. It might be the QA manager right. um, or the, just the, the owner of the application. And you can just point to the VMs and upload them to the cloud. Obviously, you need to get access to the vCenter. Yeah, That's the one access. barrier. Yeah. yeah, and you need to get the agreement for everyone. But you don't need, for example, to know exactly the network topology. You don't need to know which VM is talking to which VM over what IP and what is the IP configuration of each of the virtual machines. We extract all of that out of the VM configuration. Mm -hmm. And the network is one of the, the biggest magic, I think, that, that we develop. Because we really wanted you to be able to upload your VMs and then drag them on the canvas and the system would understand or magically figure out the network topology exactly as is and build it automatically. And, and, and it works like a magic. Uh, during the first years, uh, the first implementation was, I mean, it was a magic, but there were limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second implementation that, that, that we released a couple of months ago, actually enhanced it and adds more capabilities. Uh, yeah, and I've certainly seen a much richer networking exposed out through the portal, and we'll have a look at this a little bit later with um, one of the interviews that I did with Amit. Um, but our upload has finished. It didn't take uh, forever the way the, the progress bar initially told us it would, and, and so we now have our uploaded virtual machine. Uh, what do I need to do to get my Siebel working now in the cloud? So let's go to the uh, Revelo uh, UI. Now your virtual machine is in your library. It's, it's basically a library item. When you okay. upload it, you need to go through a, a short process of verifying the VM details. As I mentioned before, we parse the virtual machine. Uh, we, we don't change anything on the disks, but we do read the disks to try and understand what are the uh, IPs, sometimes get the uh, VLANs uh, and other pieces of the configuration extracted and put it at the, in the metadata of the VM. So the, the process here is just you go through a, a, um, a wizard just to approve the details that right. we automatically extracted. And if there are changes, you can just... So it's got a gear icon here saying there's, there's work to do. And 
edit and verify the virtual machine. It says, what do you want to call it? And yeah. I'm just going to click the finish button. I know it's brilliant. It was a good VM. It's, it's, it's imported nicely. Yeah, it's an amazing system. It always reads the correct details. So. Yeah, so we can see in here in the network adapters that it's it's got a static IP address, and we can see the, the details of that static IP address on this VM. It's all nice and easy. All right, so now my VM has got a green tick. That's got to be yep. good. So now your, your VM is in the library. You obviously have your the rest of the application in VMs. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, now it would just be enough to create an application, with, an application basically basically an object, and then drag your virtual machines on into the application. And in most cases, you're done. Sometimes you need to do a few more extra Let's, let's see let's how see. how well it yeah. did on discovering these these VMs. We'll just create our application, and this is my Siebel call center, and I'm just going to create that as a nice empty um, yeah. VAP. And now we've got this canvas, and I really like the canvas. I'm I'm a visual person for relationships between objects, and so I. I love the canvas and the network diagram in here as a way of seeing what it is this bunch of yeah. virtual machines is. Yeah. And of course, drag and drop. So there's the VM yeah. I've just up uploaded. I'll throw him in. Yeah. And uh, there's a database virtual machine as well. There's two between them at the data tier in my application. Uh, I've got an app server and a gateway server, which is the, the middle tier. And then I've got a web server that's the frontier, and that's yeah. the five virtual machines that actually make up the Siebel app. There was a sixth one in my vSphere environment that was just a firewall that provides access, and I'm going to use Ravello's built-in functionality for the firewall. Yeah, yeah. But if you would did to, you could have uh, bring your firewall as well, create, if your, your application has multiple subnets, so we can throw the firewall in between to separate between them. Right just as you would in an enterprise deployment. All right, so on other things that I need to do. Um, this app, I needed to provide access from, from the outside. Um, how does that, where am I going to do yeah. that? So uh, one thing about the network, as I mentioned, we automatically uh, figure out the network out of the, the virtual machines. Um, you may want to go and see whether the network really fits the, the, the on-premise network or you want to do changes. In most cases, the system knows how to generate the network out of the configuration. And now when you publish your application, your network would be fenced because your network is basically a copy of your on-prem network with static IPs uh, that are not supported in the cloud and you want to run it in the public cloud. Plus, you may want to create multiple copies of your application in the cloud. So you need your network to be fenced from the outside mm -hmm. world. And, but you do need to get to your application. So you need to create an entry points in your application. Those entry points are services. We call it uh, mm -hmm. supply services. So this is the, the entry point for the application. It is basically nothing, nothing grew. So uh, you would like to access your uh, front and your web mm. server through a specific port. So you create a service on that port, defined as an HTTP or HTTPS service uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the port right. number. Port number. So it. my web server is, is the front end. And mm -hmm. so that's where I go and add, yeah. add a supplied service. And I'm going to call it CC for call center. I've only got one IP address on my web server, so I'll yep. use that one, and it's going to be HTTP, ac HTTP access, but it's on port 7777 instead of the default 80. Yeah. Cool. The, uh, the protocol there is just, uh, just a hint. It had, helps you understand what is the, uh, the service that, that you mm -hmm. open up there. Uh, you can also pick up TCP or IP uh, and be uh, more specific, but HTTP is good because it, right. it also tells the system that, that this is an HTTP, the UI would provide the link and, and so on. Right. But if I was doing something like opening up an SSH connection, it's predefined and, and RDP as yeah. well, I see also yeah. predefined in there. Yeah. yeah. Now, the other thing is that like a lot of applications, um, there's a startup order that's required. There's a series of dependencies. 
Um, yeah. I understand I can configure the dependencies in the startup order yeah. here as well. Yeah, exactly. So many enterprise application applications require startup order, right? You want your database to start before the others. You want your Active Directory to start before the other components. So you can go to the Settings tab. And on the right hand, there is uh, the Add Stage uh, component there. And you can start Add Stages and define the time interval between each stage. So my first stage is the data tier. I can create a stage over here on the left because I've got a second stage, which is yep. the app tier. And I need a couple of minutes for that one too. And then my final stage is the web tier. And I don't need to wait after starting that. All right, so yep. I've now got my tiers, but I need yep. a... So now your yeah. VMs are at the, the top bucket there, there and you can assign them to the different uh, groups. All right, put that there. Okay, so it's it, w once they're assigned to a tier, they, they clear out of this list, so I can at least see which ones are assigned to a tier and which ones yep. aren't, which is nice. Gateway is in the app tier. The web server, funnily enough, is in the web tier. And the file system is also in the data tier. I guess I better save that. Great. So now so we have the list of VMs. I can see them on the canvas in a way that makes sense to me. And then there's that networking. Yeah. So that's the networking. Your the, the VMs that you uploaded were all uh, with static IPs and on the same subnet as as the network detected there. There is an additional subnet there that that's a DHCP subnet that the system creates by default. Mm -hmm. uh, in case that you have VMs that are part of DHCP, that they, they, they would be added to this subnet, but in this application, there is no use for it. So, uh, right. And, and there's, there's areas at the bottom that's it's a little hard to see on the screen that are for DHCP servers and and yeah. DNS and the, so there's a series of functions that are built into the platform yeah. that I could use. Yeah. So in order to create a copy of your on-prem network, you would need to have the typical network devices, which would be a set of switches, obviously, uh, but also a router, which you can see there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's DCP server and DNS server, uh, and there is uh, an IP filtering, which is a component that sits at the, at the entrance to the application and allows you to right. set some basic security rules uh, to the application. So that looks, looks fairly extensive and we do have that uh, a couple of other, other videos that we'll, we'll dig into yeah. that one a little. Yeah. Jeffrey, you got something for us? You got a question out there? Yeah, we got uh, uh, Keith is on, uh, Keith Thompson, the CTO advisor. So he's asking what happens with encrypted disks? Uh, does network discovery still work when it comes to that? Uh, no, it won't work because if you don't have the keys, uh, we cannot decrypt the, the disk itself. And hi, Keith. Great, great to yeah. um, have you watching. And also, um, Keith, CTO advisor, is, is one of our close friends with the build days. And uh, he has, uh, has helped us uh, make better build days. So great to, to see you, Keith. And I hope it's not too cold in Chicago. <laughs> So now we've got our, our application defined. Um, surely I need to start running it. Yeah. So uh, now we have an application in a draft mode. So it's basically just the definitions of, of I, the I, application. I've got a picture of the app. Now I need a real app. Yeah, exactly. Now we want to instantiate. It's like a, it's like a, um, uh, an object class and in, in, in an object an instantiation mm -hmm. of it in, in, in code. So we want to publish it to the cloud. So we can click on the, uh, the publish button, I guess. Publish button, yeah. And now there are two options. There is a, a cost optimized mode and a performance optimized mode. Um, the cost optimized mode is where you basically want to optimize for cost because you don't you care less about the performance. Mm. It's uh, you want to just uh, test your application, run some basic workloads, and see that, that that it works. In this case, we you don't get to choose the region in which your application is going to run. It'll just be wherever gonna, it's cheapest. Yeah, we're going to pick pick up the, the cheapest option mm -hmm. and we'll do some optimization in, in, in the back end uh, that would allow us to provide it in a, in a 
lower price mm -hmm. with some compromise on performance. The other option, the performance option, if you click on it, you see that you get a list of regions in which you can actually deploy your application. There's a long list there uh, with uh, uh, pretty extensive coverage mm. all over the globe. And you can just pick up your, uh, your region. Uh, let's go for US East 5. Uh, and these these regions are spread across multiple different public clouds. We're choosing yeah. H five because that's one of the Oracle cloud yeah. uh, data yeah. centers, and of course, yeah. Oracle this is the uh, yeah, this is the, the the Oracle uh, second generation uh, cloud, and in the uh, in, in Virginia, in, in the center of uh, or in, in the US. Of, yeah, yeah, in the US. Um, yeah, but we could have picked up uh, other regions in different places mm -hmm. and, and we currently run on Oracle uh, Classic, which is the first generation, right. the second generation of Oracle Cloud, AWS and Google regions. Great, so lots of options about where I could run yeah. Um, yeah. with different cost implications. Um, we've also got this scheduled application to stop after two yeah. hours, which seems like not what I want for my enterprise production yeah. application. Yeah. So obviously when you run production, you can pick up never. Right, that's, that's an option there. Uh, but oh, there when it's not production, you would like to well, pick up never because... Uh, How about because well, I mean, for, if, if this was a production migration, we would choose never, but I'm... You know, we, don't, yeah. we don't think this build day is going to run for more than four hours from now, so let's go with a four-hour run. Yeah. And of course, being a cloud service, you're paying for the hours that it runs. Yeah, exactly. You, you pay by the hour. Uh, this is why we provided these options because, you know, customers have told us, you know, we don't want to let us, let our developers or trainers or SEs mm. or basically the users just go wild and, and run the application and forget them uh, forever in the cloud. Even, even Alistair was saying when he was done with uh, putting something together, he would, he would instantly try and turn everything off, uh, get it back to the state, and, and, and so he wouldn't take up too much time on there. It's, it's a sort of default response for me is it's sitting on, on cloud. I need to shut it down as soon as I'm finished with it. And our, since Ravello Systems Days and now with, with Oracle Ravello, um, Ravello has had a really good program of supporting the VMware V experts and, and all of my access to the um, Ravello platform has been through that program where I get a, a amount of resource every month and that allows me to run, run labs. And so we can see as I've dug into the detailed pricing here, <laughs> the total price has struck off and, and I'm getting being saved, what is it, $1.28 an hour a um, dollar twenty-eight an hour to run five VMs with ten CPUs. That seems pretty cost-effective. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to hit the publish button on there, and our glasses turn up. I guess there's some stuff going on. Yeah. So now the uh, process is such that the system would take the overall configuration of the application and try to fit it into the right cloud instances. Uh, there's some feeding algorithm that decide which cloud instance are, is appropriate mm -hmm. or a bunch of cloud instances are appropriate for your application and how the, the, the VM should be spread uh, on, on the different instances. Uh, and first step, the system would allocate uh, an instance and the rest of the infrastructure that is needed, uh, networking disks and so on. Uh, once we get all the cloud infrastructure set up in our mm -hmm. uh, OS is booting with our uh, code on top of it, we will start the booting of, of your guests. In, in this case, we have a start order. So you can see that there are different icons on, on the VMs. Uh, so two of them uh, are scheduled to start first, but the entire cloud infrastructure is already in place. It's stood up for them. Anyway. One of the things we, Jeff and I both noticed is that we've spent time with startups in Silicon Valley and uh, we come here and we see a lot of similar aspects that there seems to be a very similar uh, startup culture here to what we see in Silicon Valley. Have, what's your experience been with the, the startup life? Yeah, so I'm, I'm in this business of almost 20 years and, and obviously all Israeli startup companies has a rep representation in the US, mainly in, in the Silicon Valley. So it's always kind of a dyada, like 
something that lives on both sides of the uh, not just the ocean. It's it's ten hours uh, difference. Time difference. So yeah. Uh, so the cultures are. I mean, there's some a lot of similarities, right? Because mm. the same com companies spread across. Um, there's some. Aspects of culture, you know, the Israeli culture is extremely different than yes. U.S. culture. At least, you know, the the, the the language, not just the language itself, but but the way we communicate. So mm -hmm. it's there's there's always, uh, usually a, a process of uh, of getting to know each other. <laughs> uh, so Israeli Israelis are known for being direct and um, and forceful in opinions. Yeah, um, and as we've, but but usually very considered. Yeah, um, it, it, it's 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 really language, right? Because you know, in in American English, if you don't agree with someone, you would say yes, I understand, uh, but let's think of a different option. In Hebrew, you say something that is directly translated to no, you're wrong. Hear what I have to say. So, <laughs> but it, it means the same. I mean, it's not impolite. It's just like. This is the way the it comes out. societal acceptance is the same <laughs> yeah. of, of yeah. yeah yeah so it gets time to uh, to learn each other but the culture at the end it's uh, it's the same in in the company the weather in the Silicon Valley is much mm -hmm. better that's uh, doesn't get quite so extremely hot one of the things I've really enjoyed is the the food here um, both out and, and visiting the restaurants and um, Gail's given us some great recommendations of restaurants that we haven't actually been able to go to nearly enough of um, but also even just the food that's provided here in in the offices um, is hummus and um, fresh vegetables and that's unprocessed very natural food and I've found that to, it fits me as a New Zealander um, to have nice simple food. Yeah Jennifer has been saying that uh, it, 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 we have to go to Tel Aviv just so I can start eating healthy so that's a <laughs> yeah. thing but it was, it's, it's been great to come here and have uh, a lot of variety of food that's for sure. Yeah food is a major theme in the I think in Jewish culture in general and Israel is a melting pot of many different Ethnicities and, mm. and and groups and everyone bring his own food and everyone's very proud with his own food. So this food is central and, and, and you know yes. it it has to be good. I mean, if there are not enough um, yogurts and there is not enough diversity in the yogurts in the fridge, it's a good reason to quit and move to a different company. And it happens to be in the past, not here in Ravello, but in different companies, people say, "Oh, there is no chocolate yogurt anymore. I cannot tolerate it. Yeah, I'm going." So, so there is some, some difference to, to sort of the, the things that, that cause people to throw their toys out of the cart are, yeah. are a little different. Yeah. Now, our um, Siebel app has, has started up, so I guess I should do something with it. Yeah. 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 So you can try and browse it, but let, let's, uh, to begin with, let's see if it's... Well, what I've got set up is, is in, in my lab environment, I actually have a, a URL in here which points to a DNS name. And that DNS name points to my current um, virtual machine. So if I, if I open this, um, this link, I get the Siebel call center, but running in my, my on-premises data center. So I thought what I would do was actually shut that down. So I actually take my on-premises copy of Siebel, and I'm going to shut it I'm going to power it off because that's going to be quicker and nobody needs to see it shut down anyway. It's my old copy. Now my real copy is up in the cloud. Uh, so what I should find then is that when I launch this this link, it um, yeah, it's not responding because I powered it off. So I was going to grab the IP address of the public IP address of the web server and change my DNS record. Um, so but that, that link now works with the, the local one. Yeah, and it looks like just here on the properties of the virtual machine, I can see its public yeah. IP address. Yeah. So since we defined a, a service on, on this VM, uh, it basically creates a natural from the public IP that we assign to the specific VM mm -hmm. uh, to the static IP that is in the internal network, that in the fence network of the application, just for the specific port. Okay. So if I grab that IP address, 
and I'll go back into the RDP session I opened up earlier to my uh, domain controller, which is my DNS server. I really should have cleaned up it. Uh, somewhere in here is my DNS. There it is, and there's my call center DNS entry. And I'm just going to change it from my internal 192.168.199 address to the cloud address. All right, that's been done. Let's see if I have to flush DNS on my client machine again. It's going to go out. Might still be trying to reach the 192.168. So let me just close that one, open up a command prompt and do an IP config slash flush DNS. Now we'll get rid of the 199 address out of my DNS cache and let's try again. Open link in new tab. What I should do is just check that that DNS change has come through. Ping, paste. Yes, so it is coming through, so my DNS is, is right. So another thing we should do before we shut down our production environment is to actually see that the VMs are booted, right? The, the completed the, the, the boot process. So up here and in the Ravello yeah, environment. So we can go to the Ravello UI, and one of the nice features is that we have a console access to the VM. Okay. This is like really a hardware console. It, it, it's, a, it's a VM console the same as the VMware VM yeah, console. Yeah. Yeah, so even if there is no network, you still get a console. Actually, you can get a console into an empty VM and install a CD from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see uh, how the console looks like and whether we completed the boot. Well, I can see that my Siebel Call Center app has actually opened up in that second tab while the, uh, the console is loading. Taking a moment or two to load the console. Let's, let's pop back. There it is. Oh. There we okay. go, my web server is up, I'm sitting yeah. waiting for a login, and um, now my okay. so, Oracle Call Center yeah. application sitting up on that, that CBI machine. And so if I can remember to type my password correctly, and that, that's not where I wanted it, I want to put my user ID in here. That's always the big challenge. <laughs> Typing things correctly while uh, dozens of people are watching on the internet is uh, always a challenge. Typing things correctly is a challenge for me when there's nobody around. This and is why the best password is one to six, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is the easiest password. And it looks like my Siebel application is, is loading just the same. And there we have, there it is, loading up. Hasn't taken us terribly long to, to take an on-premises enterprise application with, with a whole heap of database and middleware and all yep. of these things is now up and operational. And other than that, I had to refresh the, the DNS at the client side. I didn't have to do anything in this case. You know, I, the, if, if I'd um, made this change overnight while people were out of the office, they come in the next morning, the DNS record has, has been updated. Yep. Now they access the application yep. through the same URL and it's, it's now in the public cloud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that was my, our goal, and, and that's, uh, that's that's what we proud of, and and I think that this is the reason that we succeeded with this product because it has to be simple, otherwise mm -hmm. it just cannot work because of the multiple functions on the involved in building and defining application. Because the knowledge is never in one place, it's really hard to find in an organization someone who knows the application configuration, which DNS names to use, what are the IPs, what are the VLANs, and mm -hmm. how it is set up. In many cases, it's very hard to tell even which VMs are part of the of, of your application. You do need a, a discovery tool. I mean, the, not knowing how your application works isn't going to be fixed yeah. by this migration. But, yeah, but that, the, that's true. But the that, minimum that's knowledge is, yeah, yeah, is yeah. going to be required, and much less coordination with other teams than you would yeah. for on-premises deployment. Yeah. Well, I think that, that's a pretty cool thing, the ability to pick up unmodified vSphere virtual machines, push them into the public cloud and run them. Um, what other things could I do with these, these um, virtual machines, this, this app, while, uh, while I have it in the cloud? Um, 
Now we've got yeah. we've got a blueprint functionality in here, yeah. which I think is, yeah. is pretty. So cool. now now we have the application running. We tested it. It's I mean it's, it's working the way mm -hmm. it's operational. Uh, if we were doing shift and lift and and uh, lift and shift and moving it to the cloud for for production, mm -hmm. great. I mean, pretty much done. Uh, but there are many other use cases uh, that are non-production. Actually, as a startup, uh, we focused mainly on the non-production use cases, mm. just because it's uh, much early easier. On is easier to get. Yeah, it's easier for a startup to to come and you know. Uh, well, provide. trusting people with your crown jewels, your your Siebel call center, which yeah. is managing all of your CRM, that's not something you do yeah. the first time you work yeah. with a startup. That's yeah. that's new on the scene. Yeah. So, but but there are other really cool and important use cases. For example, test and dev. We internally, we use Revelo for test and development a lot. We have a concept of uh, babushka, we call it, which is basically the doll inside doll. The, the oh, that explains why there's so many of the, the Russian um, nesting yeah, dolls exactly, around the, exactly. uh, the yes. So it's basically a Ravelo inside Ravelo. So we have a blueprint of Ravelo. I mentioned what a blueprint is. And me as a product manager, if I want to see a new uh, feature, mm -hmm. I can spin up uh, a whole new Ravelo just for myself, right. right? which has the same UI, same functionality, but it's just the newest code that is not rolled to production yet. Our um, uh, automation team uh, is using those Babushka to uh, integrate it with, with Jenkins and with the CI tools. Mm -hmm. So every time there is new code, uh, pushed by the developers, it's being pushed into a, uh, a replica of production, basically, right. and being test on top of it. If a developer need to have uh, a new, uh, uh, need to have an environment to test something, he has a copy. And it's really, really important. And and we've seen it in many cases that you run your test on a replica of production. This oh yeah, a, a, a full mantra, replica of production, a not full replica. This is a mantra that we. Yeah keep on saying all the time and we've seen oh, actually one of our customers had a problem uh, just a couple of days ago uh, they were testing their scripts and things were working fine and then they're all the new ver the version to production and things failed mm -hmm. and we thought yeah oh, this is because you run your tests locally on your laptop. Right. Uh, not, on not a, a full, full yeah, copy on a, and it's uh, They're using Ravelo, but this was one of the systems that they're using in order to uh, use Ravelo. So okay. it's like a side system. You you know, you have most of those production environments, right? They have multiple parts in the multiple Lots virtual machines, right? And, and, and in many cases, when people run their tests, they're basically uh, combine them all on, into one VM. And mm -hmm. then you eliminate the network uh, aspects and, and the effect of the network. And uh, the configuration and, and is make, different. You make changes along the way to accommodate that, that consolidation. So you, your test environment, because you've consolidated it, no longer reflects your production environment. Yeah. And you often do that because you're short of resources, that you only have a limited amount of resource for, for your yeah. um, for test environment. Yeah. Always because, almost always because you're short in resources. And it's amazing. We've been... We visit big enterprises, big companies, very successful, and you mm -hmm. ask people, you know, how do your test and dev environment looks like? And they say, we have one environment for testing for for the developers, which is usually really small, like mm -hmm. one server, and there is one environment for testing, for accepting tests and so on, which is not exactly like production. You know, so okay, we have like three, four virtual machines, and just the do you, uh, there are any problems because of it? Yeah, all the time. All the time, right? because all the it time. doesn't match production. Yeah. And, and the cool thing about it, and, and it was, again, one of the, the first use cases that we focused on uh, is that now you can just like spin up an entire copy. Our babushka has, I don't know, I think 15 VMs. It changes all the time, mm. right? Mm. You spin it up, uh, run your test, shut it down after two hours. It doesn't cost much, like a few bucks. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. I mean, it's, it's full copy of production. And that, that was when I was doing some work a couple of years ago with, with Ravello around my auto lab. Um, the change in attitude that I have access to infinite resource, essentially, um, 
compared to how I developed Autolab, which was I, I have almost no resources and I have to make everything squeeze in, that shift to I have available to me near infinite resource and the incremental cost of doubling the size of, of, of the environment I'm building is not actually a, a as big a change as it is if you're buying hardware for it. It's, it's much easier to, to work and to scale these things out. That was required a mental shift for me. Yeah, yeah. Because when you increase your resources, when you buy more hardware, it's okay, you can double your capacity. But, you know, you always run out of capacity. <laughs> I mean, there is... So you get, you get hit again. When you, when you have unlimited capacity and you can burst, this is where you can really implement processes that drive agility. This is where you mm. can really do things. This is where you can do really uh, continuous integration and, and continuous deployment because you can first copy to deploy mm. to a copy of your production and then roll it to production. Uh, it's really amazing. And people are, you know, people who are basically cloud users by nature, you know, that, that are building their production environment natively on the cloud, they say, yeah, and it's easy. We just we have yeah. implement a copy and with different DNS and so on. But when you work on-prem in an enterprise environment, you just don't have this luxury. And, and with Ravello, you do. Yeah. Now, the next thing we're going to do, I've realized I've, I've missed a step in my, my preparation, and um, we may have some, some fun as we go along here. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is some of the performance improvements in the move to using the, um, the Oracle Cloud and the, some of the more advanced features of the other clouds. And um, this, this was uh, about CPU performance, essentially, was, was what we're going to spend some time on. And I've just realized that I've not started a, a performance test that, uh, that we needed to have running. So I'm just running that up now. Um, and uh, as soon as I get that running, we'll talk about um, what it is that we're doing in, with uh, CPU performance. So I'm just talk amongst yourselves as I uh, start these. Yeah. Um, so really, so really quick, uh, I just wanted to show you because these these are all around around the area, and this is uh, what they're talking about—the little nesting dolls. Um, and so I have to apologize to Gil uh, because he has this on his desk, and we're in Gil's office. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so basically, it's a it's a nesting doll. So you open it up, and there's another one inside, and you open it up, and there's another one inside, and there's another one inside, there's another one inside. This is actually funny because oh. this is an Indian version of it, right? If you look at the is it figure, the, the figure. On oh yeah, you're right. There's a sari, and <laughs> and the other one is a is more of a Russian figure. This was the closer one, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on the on the performance uh, tests, um, so we're going to talk about yeah. So. Um, one of the, the things that that was really big in the new release this year was the ability to do um, much higher performance. So as, as we discussed, the, the early, the starting work was around test and dev environments. And um, I, I feel it kind of reflects the development we saw with hypervisors over the, the life of you know, that, that revolution, that initially it was test and dev environments and relatively small environments and virtual machines. But over time, as the awareness of, of hardware got pushed up through the hypervisor and, and the requirements of the hypervisor got um, discussed with the chip vendors, we got more capability, we got um, better performance and more scalability on the hypervisors. I see mm -hmm. a big parallel to what's happened in the last year with Ravello. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how yeah. that's happened? Yeah, so, so early versions of hypervisors were, I think the very early versions were emulators and then there were hypervisors doing binary translation. I was actually involved in building a binary translator in 95, I think, mm -hmm. working for Intel. Um, binary translation is, is great technology. Basically, you take the code, the, the, the uh, machine code, translate it into a different architecture. In this case, it's the same architecture, but you want to protect from the kernel calls the, the yeah, uh, moving into uh, in, into into the kernel into the U DOS um, and you run that uh, on the cloud the next generation came when um, Intel and AMD presented their um, instruction set that supports virtualization and there they solved many problems that 
impact performance mm. for virtual machines. So for example, the synchronization of, of multiple CPUs, right, which is very hard work because the number... And, and that, that, of course, was required when they realized they couldn't keep running gigahertz faster. They had to put more cores inside each socket, and so they needed... I mean, we got these massively parallel systems, and, and yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, the feature set being pushed through into the virtual machine improved. Yeah. And uh, other features were uh, basically um, accepting the fact that there is an hypervisor because the early versions were virtual machines were basically the same as the physical, physical. machines in the mm. sense that they used uh, drivers that were designed for physical, physical devices, mm. right? So the hypervisor needed to emulate the physical device. Uh, but at a certain point, people said, okay, but there's an hypervisor below we can do much more if we are aware of the upper hypervisor right so io doesn't need to go through software emulation we can sp speak so directly we, to we don't have to have the virtual machine think it's talking to a physical switch because it's actually just talking to a chunk of memory yeah. so it doesn't have to serialize and segment yeah. the way that it does yeah. uh, the, the funky thing was in in the early days when it was all emulated you get this segmented and um data coming out of the, the virtual machine that was reassembled by the hypervisor and then segmented again by the network adapter that was physically yeah. in the host. And this is, yeah. this is where the power virtualized drivers come in and, and take that, yeah. that um, double handling out. Yeah, yeah. And the nice thing about it is that the OS stays the same because as far as the operating system concerned, there is a driver, right, mm -hmm. that's dealing with it. It's just but a network driver, driver or a storage yeah. driver. Yeah, yeah, and it's not a driver is designed for a power virtualized uh, mm -hmm. device underneath. Uh, so we went through the same um, evolution. Actually, the biggest challenge with, for us at the beginning was the fact that cloud provider, providers does not expose the hardware assist, the, mm. the instruction sets. So it's that, the Intel's VT and AMD's V instruction sets. Yeah, exactly. So you can run a virtual machine on top of the cloud, using the cloud hypervisor format. The virtual machine mm -hmm. need to should use the um, power virtualized devices of the underlying cloud. Uh, but if you want to take your VMware VM or mm -hmm. your on-prem VM and just run it in the cloud... You've got to emulate the power virtualized device and then... So v VMware typically use a power virtualized network adapter, although not so often the storage. But, but the Revelo platform has to provide the yeah. underpinnings for that para-virtualized, yeah. even though the underlying, uh, there's another hypervisor in the cloud that's, yeah. that's presenting up its own. Yeah. yeah. So the challenge was to build a hypervisor that runs on top of, uh, of another hypervisor, but mm. cannot use the, uh, the instruction set. So uh, it runs there without the knowledge of the underlying hypervisor. Yeah. Yeah. Without the knowledge of the underlying hypervisor and without the, 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 the help that you get from, from those instructions that, that are designed exactly uh, for that. So uh, that was the, uh, the magic. I think that Benny talked about it. Mm. Uh, that, was really the, that was really super smart. People just couldn't believe. You know, yeah. At the beginning, people say, eh, no way, it's nonsense. It's not going to run. Yeah, as uh, I said to Benny, I was blown away when I first saw it at, at an OpenStack summit yeah. when um, Manisha. Um, demonstrated it was just can't believe this works yeah yeah and 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 then it was on the open stock summit it was where we introduced the capability to run another hypervisor on top of it so you have the cloud hypervisor mm -hmm. and then you have the Revelo hypervisor the hvx and then on top of it you have kvm for open stock or e6 right yeah and people say okay oh, that's like too that's much th three uh, three hypervisors yeah. deep <laughs> yeah yeah but but it worked in, in relatively great performance mm. for you know the, the conditions the, much better than anyone else uh, could imagine. Um, but nowadays, when we're part of Oracle, we actually on the cloud. You know, we're on on the Oracle uh, mm -hmm. regions, we can actually benefit from the fact that we are part of the cloud provider, and we can actually use this hardware assist functionality. So you can for on cooperate the with the cloud rather yeah. than working despite the cloud. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that allows us to provide much better performance. Uh, and it's, uh, it affects in different layers of, of virtualization. One of the uh, most important one is the number of CPUs or the CPU power. Because mm -hmm. in, in an hypervisor, not just in an hypervisor, also in a real hardware, right? 
When you increase the number of CPUs, your performance doesn't increase linearly, Literally, right? Yeah. Because you need to synchronize between the, 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 the CPUs, they need to access shared resources and so on. So it's not linearly. And when you have another layer of hypervisor and another one on top of it, the synchronization becomes very hard. And part of the, uh, those hardware assists, those instruction sets that, mm -hmm. that are provided for hypervisors are there in order to help the, the process of, of synchronization. And so without the hardware assist, we wanted to stay limited to up to eight CPUs. We could run more than eight CPUs, but then the, the performance is just too much. The, I mean, the, benef the benefit of an additional yeah. CPU gets eaten by having to synchronize yeah. everything. Yeah. And now we can use hardware assist so we can go higher the number of CPUs and we can better utilize them and, and provide better performance. All right. What has gone on in my environment? Yeah, we didn't want that. We should just have this guy up. Um, that's right. We don't particularly need to see. So, what we're doing in the um, should we we will take a quick look at the, the um, at the Ravello level. So I don't need all of those ones there. We just need the Ravello piece. And you may have seen when I created the Siebel application that I already had three applications running. So this is three copies of VMware's Weathervane benchmark which is a nice general purpose benchmark that loads out all of the resource types and, and tells you whether it, it emulates a, a web auction site and it tells you at the end whether your web auction was, was running successfully or not. And, and we're using and you, you run it for a particular number of users connecting to the web auction. It's a pretty cool little benchmark. Um, we're running it in the three different modes. Um, so we're running one copy, the one at the bottom of the list is in binary translation mode, which is the, the oldest way and the, the one that works in the most places. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a, the, the top where the vein one is called hardware. That's the one that we we're talking about having that, that hardware assist, the VT instructions being passed mm -hmm. through. And the middle one is bare metal. Yeah. Um, what's that option all about? It's actually better than the hardware assist. I mean, it's using hardware assist, but so the the uh, second generation Oracle Cloud um, uh, provides two flavors of machines. One is a virtual machine, um, and the other one is a bare metal machine. So you can provision a whole host, a whole bare metal. And for us, this is great because, I mean, we always... Dreamt of, you know, being able to control the hardware so we can install everything on top of it. And this is like really uh, one layer uh, of virtualization. And this is where we can squeeze so the that, most performance possible with a hypervisor. And, so and, this uh, is the Ravello hypervisor directly on bare metal, no other hypervisor in between in the same way that yeah. other hypervisors are installed. So it's taken away the the magic of running on top of another hypervisor, but left the magic of taking unmodified VMs from, yeah. from your vSphere yeah. environment. Yeah. yeah, exactly. People thought, us, oh, if you run on, a, on, 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 bare met, on bare metal and you have the hypervisor, so what's the deal? But there, is, there is a lot of smarts on top <laughs> of it because, I mean, that was really a magic and no one believed that we can run another hypervisor on top of the cloud in, in, yes. in great performance. But there are a lot of smarts there as well. There is obviously all the different devices uh, that we built and contributed mm -hmm. to the uh, um, um, to the KVM and, and QMU mainline, and um, there is all the SDN. There is all the um, uh, capabilities around of like building and defining an application. There's there is a lot of yeah. smarts there. Uh, Good, and we're running that uh, Weathervane benchmark, and I've started a, a run for 1,500 users of, of the Weathervane benchmark. Uh, actually, it's, it's a way it's running. It's gonna take, it takes quite a while to run a good benchmark, and Weathervane yeah. is, is a good benchmark. We've got it fairly tightly down that it doesn't run for hours, but it still runs for quite some time. Uh, it's running in these these apps. These three apps are exactly the same. They're deployed from the same blueprint that, again, Canal uh, provided for me. And uh, there's, as you can see, what have we got? Seven virtual machines in there. Uh, and each of the virtual machines is four vCPUs, eight gigs of RAM. RAM. Uh, so it's quite a lot of resource in each of these runs. Uh, but they are taking some time to run to tell us yeah. how, how the results yeah. are. So benchmark and performance is, you know, it's 
it's always complicated, right? Oh, yes. Because people say, you know, yeah, we ran, uh, it's just like, you know, IO tests, mm -hmm. right? And we see the number as such and such. But, you know, it doesn't mean anything. Benchmarks are performance in general. It's really dependent on so many components. I mean, there's there's the CPU, but not just the the, the, the horsepower, the gigahertz, but it's mm -hmm. also the way CPUs uh, uh, synchronize between each other, and the memory access to the CPU, and the memory itself, and then the disk access, and mm -hmm. then uh, the the multitasking inside the application because you have in, in a real life scenario you have users hitting your web server and there are multiple things happening at the same time and then there is a communication it's really really complicated so a good the right way to measure performance and whether performance is right for you is to take your application and run the workloads that you're going to run. That's yeah. the only thing that would give you the real numbers. The final test is, is real users yeah. doing real tasks with real data. Exactly. And everything else is is, is a facsimile. And yeah. that's essentially what we're doing here is um, not benchmarking a real application, but allowing us to show a comparative um, performance across the different platforms. Exactly, uh, but with a real application that has multiple yes. components and is doing like real life It's not a synthetic tasks. workload, it's, yeah. it's a uh, real application representation workload, which yeah. is the nice ones for, um, for running benchmarking. I've always been intrigued by the interaction between the, the different CPU features and architectures and the actual delivery of performance into the applications and the impacts and sort of the the way that some things are huge changes and some things are, are relatively small changes and um, the different ways that CPU is being delivered here are interesting as well. Uh, we're still running through the, the benchmark, so Weathervane is still uh, hard at work pushing these virtual machines and, uh, and finding out how well they run. Um, so what I thought we should do is have a look, look at a little bit more of what's going on in the uh, Ravello UI. And um, yeah. I think there were a couple of things you wanted to, to look at in yeah. here as well. Yeah. So <clears throat> there are some things that maybe we should talk about Blueprint uh, mm -hmm. to begin with. So Blueprint is basically um, like a snapshot of the entire application, of the entire environment. It's like a, like a VM snapshot where you take the state of the disks uh, but it's for the other VMs in the application and the state of the network and the the rest of the metadata of, of the application itself. And Blueprints are really cool because then you can have, you can instantiate an application out of a Blueprint in a click or an API call. So you can mass produce <coughs> from, yeah. from that Blueprint, the, the same as a, yeah. an actual Blueprint for manufacturing. Yeah. yeah, and then an entire application or entire uh, workload becomes basically um, an object, a library item, right, which you can right. speed up uh, immediately. And because network is fenced, you can then create multiple copies of your application. So, again, test and dev is one example. You can create multiple copies of uh, of your production environment to run your multiple tests on top of it. A copy for each developer or a group of developer or automatic tests. Uh, other use cases would be training, for example, mm -hmm. if you have a class of 20 students and each one you would like to, each one have multiple VMs in his application, you can mm -hmm. just spin up 20. As a, uh, as a trainer, this, doing it through this method would have been great because um, the number of times that I, I would troubleshoot the, the lab build for a new course where I would have eight sets of physical hardware and, and if the deploy hadn't worked correctly for all of them, I'd be going in and, and fixing multiple of them uh, and it was on physical hardware and we, we know how challenging that can yeah. be. Yeah, exactly. So the blueprints live in the library, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you can go to the library. And there we yeah. go, there's, there's my blueprints. So if you are in the, the weather vane, mm. there, uh, there we go, if I select with the weather vane and... Yeah, just you know, click on the link itself, the name of the, the blueprint. The, yeah, oh. if I can drive my Mac. Yeah, so it opens up a blueprint which looks just like your application, mm. but not published. Uh, so you can see you know, the VMs, same configuration as everything, the same network. It's basically the 
blueprint for your application. And now if you want to create another copy of weather vane out of this blueprint, you just click on the, uh, the button there and go through the same uh, process as when we created uh, a new application from scratch, only this time the VMs would be there with their uh, configuration. All right, so when I created the uh, application for Siebel, I created an empty application and I dragged yeah. in the virtual machines that yeah. I wanted. Whereas yeah. this time I've got all, all seven of my virtual machines already there. Yeah, yeah. And if you click the publish button, you go through the same uh, process as we've seen before. Uh, and I, I'm going to take, take cost optimized because cost cost. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. again, nice. Quick, quick and easy. Yeah. Um, the wait for, as as we heard from uh, Einav, the the population of of the um, block storage and the creation of that container virtual machine that's running the um, HVX hypervisor is is the the thing that takes a little while in here. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's not a, a time that I need to interact with. Nice, nice and easy way to to build out a bunch of VMs, and obviously I. Built out the uh, the three weather vane apps that we're using to run uh, run our benchmark now from this, which is was nice. How are we going on progress today? Oh, look, we've completed. So let's take a look what we've got. Let's start with binary translation, which is the oldest CPU type in this this bright. Oh no, that hasn't finished yet. So maybe we'll uh, we'll have a look at hardware assist. So hardware assist has run this fifteen hundred user auction benchmark, and um, the thing that, that I look at in this is how responsive was my application. And so there's an average response time in here uh, that shows as 0 0.013 seconds, so 13 milliseconds response time. That's considered to be acceptable for a, a website. Uh, and so I've got a, a spreadsheet. I'm just going to track in a spreadsheet here the performance of, of these. So my hardware assist with 1500 users was doing 13 milliseconds and bare metal so the hardware system bare metal were both ones that are running on the oracle cloud infrastructure yeah uh, and uh, again both of them running the same workload but bare metal has has been even better for, for latency it's it's down at seven milliseconds for these 1500 users so uh, we're seeing you know, better application performance even though they're, they're not saturated and then how's my binary translation going Still, still taking a little while. It uh, looks like it's it's um, has to work a little harder. There we go. That was fifty four milliseconds for binary translation. So all three of them successfully ran fifteen hundred user auction site. That's a good thing. We've definitely got some performance going on. Uh, but it's immediately we can see that there's there seems to be better performance from the the hardware assisted yep. and, and bare metal. Uh, as you can see from the, the spreadsheet, I'm going to ramp it up. I'm going to double up the user count, and uh, we'll see see how that behaves. So we'll just get that started to run a uh, 3,000 users in binary translation, 3,000 users in hardware. Get my spaces in the right places, and 3,000 users of BIM. 1,300 would be too easy. So a fresh run of Weathervane again with more concurrent users on the auctions and that therefore means more workload going on. So Noam and I looked at quite a lot of the parts of the user interface, but there are a couple of things we didn't have a look at that you mentioned that could be interesting. What should we have a look at first? Yeah, so there are, there are a bunch of other features that are very useful for multiple use cases and enterprise usage. Uh, we can start by looking at availability groups, for example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so if I pop back in here and let's look at this newly created WeatherVane application that I've deployed that's not currently running WeatherVane. Um, what are availability groups and where, where are they in here? So in, in, in a production environment, you would like to... So um, it's... It's a, a, a late night here. Um, so it's Thursday, which is the end of the working week here in, in Israel. And uh, it's currently nine o'clock at night. And we suspect there's a bit of maintenance going on in the building. And you will have heard quite a bit of audio interference going on. And 
Um, my guess is there's some electrical equipment here which is just bursting out in RF. So um, please forgive the noise. It is because yeah. we're at such a uh, late time here. It's one of the interesting things about being in Israel is that the working week does not begin on Monday here. It begins on Sunday. It begins on Sundays and it ends on Thursday. And uh, this is now the end of the week for us, but the U.S. is still to uh, still two working days. days. Yeah, yeah. And when you when there need to be some maintenance in the building, so people are asking, okay, when should we come and do the maintenance? So mm -hmm. won't bother anyone Thursday uh, evening after, after the right working now. week is over. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and of course now outside us, uh, there's almost nobody here in the uh, the Oracle Ravello offices at this time on a Thursday evening because they're home with the families or or out with their friends. Uh, apart from the maintenance workers who are helping our audio to yeah. be challenging. We we're going to have a look at uh, the function in here for availability groups. Yeah. So basically, availability group is just a feature that would let you define uh, a group of VMs and say, these this VMs need to run on different hardware. And in the cloud world, it means two different availability zones, availability domain, availability groups, the terminology mm -hmm. is different in different clouds, but, but it's basically separating it to, out so that they're, they're across two different failure domains. Yeah, exactly. Infrastructure. Two different buildings, basically. Uh, and the way to set it up is pretty simple. There, there are two availability groups currently that we provide in Rovello, mm -hmm. and you can just say, you know, this VM is part of the first availability group, and the second one is part of the second availability group. Uh, it's been marked on the VM itself in mm -hmm. the uh, configuration. I haven't done it for a while, so let's try and figure out oh, where it exactly that. is. And of course, this this yeah. application is currently running, so I can't change. Yeah. Um, well, exactly. why don't I just deploy us a new application that we can make a change on? Yeah. Um, you cannot change it on a running application because the VMs are already deployed. So you can just say, okay, deploy it somewhere else. And being all cloud and, and all virtual, it's, I've already created. Exactly. Here's my new yeah. VAP, uh, new application, and now I can change. So one's in availability group one. And this other virtual machine can be in availability group two. Yeah. Now, this presumably has some impact on on cost for me because now instead of having the possibility of running all these VMs in, inside one instance of HVX, I've now got to have two instances of HVX and I imagine that's that's going to have a cost impact. It has impact on, it may have impact on us. As far as you're concerned, the pricing is based on the... The, the workload the, that I'm running. Yeah, yeah. Right. So... It, it, it has nothing to do for with availability group for you. I mean, we would need to now figure out how to fit it in in different hardware pieces, different mm -hmm. infrastructure underneath the application. But we deal with it, so uh, it doesn't change your pricing. So again, like a cloud provider, you um, for a start, you, the bills for all of these VNs come from Oracle Ravello rather than yeah. from the individual yeah. cloud providers. Yeah. Yeah, but, the, the, but you handle all of the, the yeah. underneath making sense of that. Yeah, yeah. That was also very important for us uh, from the beginning to kind of abstract the underlying clouds because as far as you're concerned, this is a, a, a workload that came from the on-premise. You should not care in which region it, your, your uh, workload is running. So it is important in terms of where in the globe it's going to run. And nowadays, when we are part of Oracle and we support the Oracle regions, then there is some privilege to the Oracle regions. But other than that, the, the goal is to uh, make it completely abstract. Um, and also, in order to do it, we wanted to abstract the, 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 the billing part. So right. you work with Ravello. You pay to Ro Ravello, and we deal with the, uh, the cloud infrastructure. You don't need to create multiple accounts and tie them into uh, your Rovello environment. Um, so we started this way, and obviously, billing in cloud is uh, is, is a big issue. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you start. We noticed it at the beginning ourselves. We started small, the R and D, and then we came up with this babushka concept, and we start using Rovello for R and D. Multiple of your workloads, then. Yeah, and you know, I remember the 
very first days before we really had a service, it was not, I mean, it was just development stage as mm -hmm. we were in stealth mode and we had two servers in the, uh, in the office and you keep on hearing people shouting, who just reboot uh, <laughs> my Tomcat, who started the Tomcat? Mm -hmm. And at, this, at that point we said, okay, we have to eat our own dog food and we're now using uh, only Ravelo to develop Ravelo. There mm -hmm. is no hardware in the office. There is only DHCP and, you know, the relevant security pieces. Right. There is no data center that, that we manage. Um, so it's all in Ravelo. In the beginning, obviously, you know, things went wild. The account went wild. And then we understood that we need to put some controls, some controls. on top of it. Mm -hmm. So this is why we have this, like, stopping stop timer on the application. Um, so that came about because you saw your own developer's behavior rather yeah. than, than, yeah, that's, yeah. that's interesting how these things come about. Yeah, yeah, of course. Our own developer behavior, which is obviously you can, so you use it, but mm. on the other end, it's like, you know, you as a developer, you don't pay the bill, so you yeah. need something to help you uh, take Helps you to behave nicely. Yeah, yeah. So there's this feature, and there are also other nice features on the billing uh, mm -hmm. um, administration page, which we can actually uh, look at. Um, Whereabouts do I find that? we have time for it. So it's at the admin and... and billing and budget. Yeah. So this is the, the basic view. You can see the monthly uh, it's it's always monthly. You can select different months, but this is for December. You can see the overall cost and how it is being broken down by components. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the list of applications running, stopped, and deleted through the month. So you can see uh, how much uh, of your budget was consumed by each application and each user. Uh, so that's that's the the first thing. You can also extract it into CV into a CSV file and run your uh, analysis on top of it and feed that back into potentially a showback system internally for your teams. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we should be showing shekels as opposed to uh, as opposed to dollars here because <laughs> that'll that'll really uh, blow people's minds how how many shekels that that is. But we do have uh, Daryl Lundy on here who's uh, who's first time uh, for Build Day Live. And uh, he's asking, does each dev have their own Ravello login or HVX? So each developer has his own user, right? His own just username, uh, password. Uh, HVX is is completely abstracted from the users. I mean, as far as the user concern, he can run spin up application and develop blueprints and VMs. And the, the developer itself doesn't need to care about HVX. We care about it. Uh, we take care about it. Uh, you just get your user, you log in, and you can start doing your stuff. You can now put some uh, restrictions on users, right? You can uh, define different permissions and permission groups per user. So you can have your QA team and your R&D team, and you can say, okay, QA team has access to this list of resources and R&D has access to a different list of resource. resources in terms of blueprints and NVM. So, so it, can, it can you also do quotering? Sorry? So can you do quotering and, and say this group of users are allowed to spend X dollars per month? Is that in the product? So you, you can do uh, you can do something really, really, there is no like control. You cannot mm -hmm. stop them from using it, but you can set up alerts and you, uh, alarms and okay. you can see exactly uh, how much dollars uh, each uh, developer consumed or each right. group consumed. And if we go back to the uh, bidding and budget uh, page, then you can create cost buckets. Cost buckets are basically like uh, like cost centers, basically buckets uh, where you want to put your uh, billing at. So this is so maybe one I have one, one for Siebel and uh, one, f oh, hang on, I don't want a bucket inside a bucket there at that level. You can uh, create an IRQ. I, I can, but uh, yeah, um, I might have a separate bucket for my weather vane testing. Yeah. So now there are two buckets and you would like to associate your 
applications with different buckets. So you can do it on the application at the application level, right? You can mm-hmm. go to application and the settings uh, tab. You can attach your application into a cost bucket. But what you would usually like to do is you would like to uh, differentiate it by users, right? So you would like to say um, Alistair is using all the workloads are on the uh, first bucket, which I see its name. I've got a bucket and called Withervane here, which now contains yeah. my three Withervane apps that I'm running. Exactly. And Jeffrey can only access the other, has permission to spin up application at the other budget. And then it's completely seamless, right? Because when you come and publish an application, you get to choose on which cost bucket to put the mm-hmm. application, but you'll have only the Withervane and allowed. Jeffrey would only have the other one. Uh, if you have access to multiple buckets, then you can just put decide mm. on which bucket you want to put your application at. And on a bucket, you can then set alerts based on your budget. So you can say my QA team is limited to a $500 budget a month, and I want to get alert when I reach 70% of, uh, of their budget. We wanted to avoid uh, putting real control features on top of it right. because that's really tricky in this kind of environment, right? It's really easy to exceed the the, the, the limit because if your budget is too small and we're working in an hourly resolution, it right. might be the case that you stop the application when you reach the budget, but at the end, you would exceed it significantly if you're running a lot of applications. Um, yeah, the alerting uh, and, and visibility, I think, is, yeah. is useful in there as letting people know that they've used their allocation yeah. but not stopping them from being productive at that point. Yeah. And you can send the alert to their manager, which would take responsibility and say, okay, guys, you're reaching 70% and it's just mm-hmm. the middle of the month. That's yeah, what are we doing different? Because, yeah. 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 Nice. By the way, the, uh, the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, the systems that sits on top of Rovello has some similar functionality that also has control uh, right. for your entire uh, Oracle Across budget, spend, not just yeah. their other one. Is there is there some sort of uh, way to kind of if if things go go overboard too fast? Is there a way that uh, that it can be uh, stopped or or, or forced? Would to everything stopped? just stop, or or would they continue to go? With the with this functionality inside Rovello, no, you just get an alert. Uh, with the Oracle, the OCI functionality, sit on top of it. Yes, you can you can set up. I think it's called hard uh, quota. Hard stop, or, right. Yeah, yeah. So you reach a quota, and it would. Uh, I think that then it would prevent you from spinning up other applications. that depends on the configuration. Now let's just see if all of our our. our um, Weathervane is still running here in the, the last, uh, in this, this 3000 user um, load is still running. Um, but so we get some really good visibility in the billing there. We get the ability to have multiple users accessing the same account and devolve control of parts of it. So that's, that's nice sort of um, functionality in there. We've looked at the availability groups. While, um, actually just as we started the video with Benny, the final of the uh, 3000 user Withervane benchmark runs completed. And so here we can see that with the binary translation, uh, the average response time became uh, somewhat of a problem at 8400 uh, milliseconds and the uh, only 70% of the transactions succeeded. So clearly we have saturated the binary translation at uh, 8,395, so 8,395. And my conditional formatting says that's not good, it's, it's gone red. Uh, on the other hand, the hardware assist, uh, it's still down at 37 milliseconds and 99.97 uh, percent success, so that's that's still good. That was uh, 37 milliseconds. Uh, so it's become a little more loaded, but it's still coping just fine. And bare metal uh, now has has climbed to 10 milliseconds and 100% success. Uh, so bare metal is still giving us the best performance, and 
we can see a, a shift in capability that if we needed to accommodate this number of users on this configuration, binary translation isn't going to cut it for us. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll kick off the, the 6,000 user run, and um, you had some commentary on that one? Uh, yeah, sure. I think that I think barely nothing in life scales in a linear way, and definitely performance in in computation environment. So we can see that at a certain point things just breaks. Um, and um, Kunal, who who helped me with all of this, the setting up, was saying what he had seen with Weathervane is that when it it starts to degrade, it very quickly hits a cliff and performance absolutely yeah. tanks. And that, to me, reflects a lot of the tier one applications that we see out in production. That there is there is a a knee where the performance starts to degrade, and then it, it falls off a cliff, and uh, you get a lot of help desk calls and people who are very unhappy with performance at that point. Yeah. Hey, Tony Reef uh, commented on Twitter about uh, hoping this content will be available later because he's missing some as he has to go into meetings. All of the V Brown Bag Build Day content ends up on YouTube, so you can have a look at us on youtube.com slash vbrownbag. Of course, some of you will be watching this and the recording on that channel have already found it. Um, but absolutely all of our content available, available to freely consume at, at your leisure and download onto your favorite device to watch as you commute. Um, the uh, weathervane still running. Uh, it's going to be a little while yet to to run up, and um, I'm running a little dry on things to say at this point. Uh, yeah. Um, so we could talk a little bit about um, UI versus API, mm -hmm. um, and so it's like in every cloud-based system. I mean. Uh, APIs has to be a you know the major way to use the system, and this is how we de we design Ravel to you know from from day one. Um, so everything that you can do with the UI, you can do with API. Actually, our UI is built on top of our public API. There's no hidden. There's no private APIs. No that, private that APIs driven by there. the UI. Yeah, everything is is, is just uh, public APIs. Uh, it's a RESTful API, quite simple. You can do really cool things about it. And we have a video by Matan showing uh, how you can use the API. Um, and actually, uh, many of our bigger customers are using the APIs. It's just like building their systems uh, using our API and, and integrating them in, into their uh, workflows. And we, we saw at the um, Prevella Blogger Day um, <clears throat> six months ago that there are customers who use their own interface, their own web interface for their customers that then drives the Revelo API to deliver that, that service back to the customer, which is yeah. which is a pretty cool functionality. Yeah, it, it's good and it's important if you if you want to grow as, as, as a company because we love our UI and it's really great and mm. I can talk a lot about the, the the canvas there and how important it was for us as a startup to, to succeed really it has huge psychological impact even on mm. on customers it somehow magically uh, simplify the complexity of, of an application even though it doesn't add any extra information I mean, you can just like usually you see a list of VMs with well, the, the details yeah, and now software developer the wants the, the table of information but but I as an operations engineer want something yeah. more more tangible or visible yeah and eventually even software engineers end up liking this and mm. again it doesn't add any extra information it just kind of simplifies the complexity and it makes you feel like you understand what's going on mm. there um, but there's tons of functionality that you can build on top of uh, on top of a UI, uh, and this functionality differs from customer to customer. And eventually, when you have user of a, of a system, any cloud system, you end up mm -hmm. building your own portal because you have slightly different flows, and their uh, your your uh, permission mechanism is slightly different, and you have different types of layers of users, customers, internals, and so mm -hmm. on. And and usually you'd like to bake it into your uh, other backend systems. Uh, so most of our big customers are actually building, starting with our UI and we have some other um, 
small ca capabilities that we added to help people bootstrap like a training portal. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually, they're just building their system on top of, to on top of our APIs. Yeah. 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 Right. So the, the ability to use the API and, and the language bindings that are the SDKs that are provided is really useful to scale your use of Revelo. That the um, clicking in the UI is good for doing one or two half a dozen for your app, uh, application deployments, but to get to high velocity, large volumes uh, using the API is a really central part. Yeah. Especially so, when you look at, for example, continuous integration and mm -hmm. automation, test automation, this is really strong. And, and this is again where the full copy of production that stood up just for the duration of the test and is torn down and, and thrown away as soon as the test is yeah. complete. That, uh, that integration is, is really cool. We are still waiting for the, um, for the weather vane run. It's still uh, running through 6,000 users worth of auctions. And um, I think one area that we haven't really talked about is storage because of course, with all of these machines, they've got to be stored somewhere. We've talked a, a little bit about, about how it works, um, but there is a crucial part of, of storage underneath all of this. Yeah, storage, uh, yeah, there, there are actually all kind of interesting challenges with, with storage and, and cloud and the fact that you want to have, so we said that you can spin up your applications, your application multiple times. You start with a blueprint and you spin it up a couple of times in one region and then you need to spin it up in a different region. It could be Australia, right? So it might be that you developed your application in uh, Virginia, in, in the US, and now you mm. need to spin up a couple of copies in, in Australia and then in Sao Paulo. And there's a lot of stories that need to be spread uh, and, and being sent all over the, all over the place. And it's uh, obviously very challenging and yeah. not just that when you boot and you start your application, you need to get your storage into a different remote uh, location. Uh, it's also when you save a snapshot, it needs to get back. When you set, you can save a blueprint and then spin up another copy from the blueprint somewhere else, there's a lot of storage moving here and there. Um, and um, uh, I mean, talk about the, the, the implementation, but um, one thing that is important to remember also when you use the system is that when when you boot up the application, we do not fetch all the storage right into the instance because that mm -hmm. will take a lot so of time, right? Mm -hmm. We uh, we basically start by mounting the 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 VMs are mount the OS is mounting a disk, but the disk is actually on a cloud file system that is distributed, mm -hmm. and when you start fetching the blocks. When you start the, the boot and the, the OS needs a bit of uh, disk to start the booting start process, it, it would start fetching the data from wherever the data is, might be remotely or local. And right. when the VM is trying to access another bit of the disk, it would fetch the, the next bit of the... And it has uh, um, uh, also effects on, <clears throat> on boot time, for example, and mm -hmm. also on performance. So, we, we run uh, uh, the, the benchmarks here. Uh, we know that the data, the applications are running and, and disks are, are there. Um, if we now spin up the same application in Sydney mm -hmm. and start the, the, uh, the benchmark there, the first run would obviously be very, very slow because we need to fetch the data. We need to warm up the local yeah. copy of data. We need to warm up the local copy. And it's not just that, it's um, if you take a VM, if you run the benchmark for the first time, and then you try to access another bit of the disk that you haven't touched yet, mm -hmm. it would go and fetch this bit as well. There is a, at the background, there is a process that's trying to prefetch and, and bring the right. rest of the, uh, the data, but, but there's a process there. There's, there's also a cost involved in moving between regions for, for cloud providers. And so you want to optimize that and not retrieve data that's never going to be accessed. So I, yeah. Yeah, there's a balance to be played yeah. in there. Yeah, there's a balance. And this is why we also have the caching systems and so on that, that I mean, described in, in, in this talk. And we 
got to the end of the Wervane runs. And uh, surprise, surprise, binary translation that couldn't cope with 3,000 users coped even, even less well with 6,000 users. Its uh, response time now was up to uh, 17 seconds. So I'll pop that into my spreadsheet and uh, be unsurprised. What was it? 17164. Uh, unsurprised to see that that comes up as being a, a big bunch of bucket of fail. Um, hardware Assist also struggled with 6,000 concurrent users. And so again, we can see that, that it's not had as hard a time as the binary translation build, but it's still not a happy, happy place for our uh, 6,000 user auction. Uh, but on bare metal, uh, the latency is just sitting there at 62 microsecond, uh, milliseconds, and uh, we had 99.98% success. So I think that's, that's some fairly clear numbers around the difference between the performance for binary translation, hardware assist, and, and bare metal. Uh, we obviously, as we discussed, benchmarking is, is tricky, and this is really just a comparison rather than being an absolute number. This yep. doesn't say that you should run a, a, uh, an auction website at these sizes, but that there are different options in here about yeah. how you run these VMs. Yeah, and it's always always about uh, cost and performance. Well, we're definitely suffering from the Thursday evening here with the uh, internet connection coming and going as well. I think maybe the uh, there's a welding uh, torch being used, which is causing our interference, which is then taking down the internet. There was something weird's going on. Welders but, use the internet. It's, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's the IoT welder. Um, so we were talking about the complications of a benchmark and that really we were just doing a comparison here rather than a scientific benchmark of, of um, capabilities. Um, but we do definitely see that differentiation of service. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's important to remember that performance by itself is not... I mean, you need to think about cost performance, right? So that's another... Yeah, and, and that there's there's a huge number of use cases where binary translation is going to be absolutely ideal because it's not about performance so much as, as getting functionality. Yeah. So that really does bring us to the end of the things we wanted to show in this build day. Uh, the significant things were that we took an on-premises enterprise application, the, the, the case of um, Siebel Call Center, and we migrated it up into the cloud and it operated exactly the same. Unmodified virtual machines, change management is going to be interesting on that one. Um, the other thing I possibly didn't highlight was when we uploaded that file system virtual machine, we started with a running virtual machine on my ESX server. It didn't have to all be shut down in order to do the up upload. In a production deployment, you're probably going to want to do something about um, synchronizing the, the data tier and making sure you don't lose transactions. But we were able to bring the thing up. And if you if you're doing that as a, a pull of a production application to do test dev, you don't have to shut down the production application on your vSphere cluster in order to get it onto Rebello, which is all pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and then we looked at the uh, different performance of the different CPU virtualization types and just got an illustration of doubling of capacity yeah. for this particular uh, workload as we move between the, the three different types of virtualization. Um, so it's all pretty cool. I've, I'll say I've been a fan of this technology for a long time. I think it's a really cool um, product and a, a really cool way of working with a cloud solution. And um, I was delighted to come here and spend some time in, in Israel and, um, and to show this to, to some more people. So if People who are watching this video are looking for more information. What sort of places can they find more more information about the uh, Rovello solution? So there's a uh, there's a lot of information on the Rovello page on the on the Oracle website. Uh, there are plenty of uh, videos as well, which I think you can also find on YouTube. Uh, there are a lot of blogs that we've created earlier, the days of uh, Rovello, and there. Now also in the on the Oracle blog uh, infrastructure, and there's also a lot of blogs and materials that you guys created <laughs> in the experts community. Uh, you guys were very supported uh, through oh, the years. We, uh, we um, appreciate it particularly. Um, um, for me, Shruti Bhatt was a, a 
I think VP of marketing in the, the Ravello Systems days. I know she's gone on to, to have a, a similar role across the whole new Oracle cloud now. And um, Shruti, missing you. Um, sorry, I didn't, haven't seen you in a while. Um, but she made some really smart marketing choices and about engaging the, the vexpert community. And I think that's, that has, has paid off very nicely for her. Um, but also there's, there's the, um, there's the evaluation. There's the, yeah, the, yeah, the there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's the, the, it's a free trial. It's actually a three hundred dollars uh, promo uh, on the uh, Oracle uh, cloud infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The promo is for all Oracle services, so uh, you guys should try uh, all the suite of services. But uh, Ravello is part oh, of it. Uh, yeah, you can sign up for the uh, for the the promo. Uh, you need to put your credit card, but the First, I think I think thirty days. I'm not sure, but three hundred dollars uh, are free, and you can opt in and out uh, whether you want to continue using it or stop at the end of the promo. But it would allow users to actually uh, test and 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 see how the system is working. Great, and that, that hands-on experience is yeah. is really the yeah. proof for those of us in the, the engineering space. And it's it's usually. Uh, quite a lot in order to really test and understand the system. Mm. We design again. We designed it from day one. We we had this free trial, two weeks uh, free trial in Ravello, and we really worked hard to build the system such that uh, users can accomplish uh, at least an initial POC and get really confident with the system inside in, in that free really time. Quick. Yeah, nicely. Mm. So there have been a lot of people who have been involved. Um, um, thank you, Gal, Gal Moab, for, for being here with me and, and um, helping us to, to show and explaining some of the things on the inside. So that, uh, we've had some really good logistic assistance this week. Um, so we've, we've had Amir on the video, but Amir Tito helped us with, with the logistics of getting the networking all connected. And um, we've had our friend right outside the door, Juan who has helped us to make sure that we got the right spellings of, of the Israeli names because uh, they're interesting, interesting spellings yeah. along. Uh, we had um, Ahmed Ebner and Omri and Natan and Noam and Einar uh, and of course Benny uh, all presenting for us and it's been great to meet them and, and thank you uh, as a team for, for coming in and supporting us with that. Thanks also to the Tech Reckoning team, um, John and Kat who helped us set this all up and uh, are very active in helping startups and tech organisations engage with bloggers and, and influencers. Um, now, who else? Oh, and, and Kunal I've mentioned, but also um, Simon and um, my um, uh, an advocate for us also within uh, Oracle Ravello of Naveen. Um, this this came about because he and I had breakfast uh, after the the uh, Ravello Blogger Day. So, lots of people go into making this, and of course right behind the switching gear and uh, in a few of the video, um, my partner in crime, uh, Jeff, um, making us all look good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, as uh, Roni said, uh, uh, what, 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 what word did we learn? Not that other word, but we, we learned we, to say thank you. We and learned to say uh, toda. So we say toda. So thank you. Right. Toda and uh, shalom. And uh, I know you guys are going to have your holiday week next week, which is not really a holiday for you guys. It's um, not a day off from work, but it's a, it's a holiday. Yeah. So it's, it's a holiday a, in your mind of yeah. uh, reflection. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a Hanukkah. It's, the, it's equivalent to uh, Christmas also at the same time. It's also about mm. the light. But yeah. Kids get the day off. We get to eat a lot of uh, soup which is, food. Yeah, <laughs> well, really fat. A lot of great food here. So, oh yeah. I, I wish we could be here next week, but uh, <laughs> you know we'll be flying back, unfortunately. So, so uh, all these videos will be on YouTube as, as our <laughs> travel permits, and uh, hopefully very shortly. So keep a watch out for those. And of course, um, happy holidays to everybody. And we will see you for V Brown Bag Tech Talks and V Brown Bag Build Days through, throughout 2018. So yeah. thank, thank, you. Much, Gal. thank you guys for the opportunity. It was fun.